Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Monday, July 1st, 2013, and here are our top stories. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Russian forces are set to provide security at U.S. events. Then forget about the blue gloves, prepare to be groped by the wet noses. And more on how NSA's prison system puts you in a database prison. All that and more coming up on the InfoWars Nightly News. G.I. Joe command base is run by Cobra. Well, we've seen our police militarized. We've seen our military being used as police. Now, in a breaking story from Paul Joseph Watson on InfoWars, we see that the Russian forces are going to provide security at U.S. events. In the article on InfoWars, it says, as part of the deal signed last week in Washington, D.C., between the Russian Emergency Situations Ministry and FEMA, Russian officials will provide security at mass events in the United States, a scenario that won't sit well with Americans who are wary of foreign assets operating on U.S. soil. The use of foreign troops or other officials in a law enforcement capacity providing, quote, security inside the United States is illegal under posse comitatus. Now, this is something that we've seen happen before in empires, of course. The Romans were famous for doing this, and the British did it to a large degree during the British Empire. And that is taking troops that are not native to a particular area, or taking competing ethnic groups, and using one ethnic group that's had a conflict with a second ethnic group in the past, using that group to police that ethnic group, and vice versa. It would be a lot easier for our government to collect guns and confiscate guns and shoot on Americans if they're not using American soldiers, if they're using Russian soldiers. But of course, even using the American military to do that is against the Constitution. But it'll just be a matter of effectiveness for them to do that. Now, this is something that's been happening for quite some time. As the article points out, going all the way back to 1961, we have a leaked document, the State Department Publication 7277, in that document, it talked about U.S. troops and Russian troops joining together to create a peaceful disarmament under the U.N. Then we also had the urban warfare drills of the 1990s, reported by Alex Jones multiple times in the news and documentaries. In 2008, we saw the U.S. and Canada have a joint military agreement to help each other out during quote-unquote emergencies. And in 2010, we had Operation Vigilant Guard with Polish troops. And then, of course, last year we had Russians doing policing work in Colorado Springs. Now, this all came from a Russian publication. This is where Paul Joseph Watson found it. Uh, and that's referenced in the article, so you can read it for yourself. We're not making this up. A very dangerous precedent, something we're increasingly seeing. As I said, it goes back to 1961. But the frequency of which is happening, the openness with which it's happening, is what is really concerning, as well as these increasing frequencies of urban warfare drills. Now, there's been a change in TSA at the Denver airport. And uh, you may wonder if it's any better to get sniffed by a dog than handled by a TSA agent. But some people seem to think that that's an improvement. In a uh, report from CBS Denver, it says a major change is coming to the security lines at DIA. And there's a couple of quotes that are uh, from tweets that are in there, but through airport security without taking my shoes off, removing anything from my bag, or being scanned. That person's so happy that happened. Another person tweeted and said, straight through security in just two minutes with shoes on and laptops and liquids in a bag. And finally, the article points out the TSA's website says its canine teams are a mobile form of explosive detection and are extremely accurate. Isn't it sad? that people are so excited that they can pass through and only have a dog sniff them instead of another, instead of a person manhandling them, fondling them. Can't you remember when you were able to travel with freedom and dignity in this country? It wasn't that long ago. And you didn't have to get excited about the fact that you were merely smelled by a dog. But the thing that's also troubling about this is the emphasis on efficiency. You know, it was said that Hitler made the trains run on time, but maybe the destination of Auschwitz is not where you want to head. Uh, and we have seen historically that the TSA is not really doing anything. At least maybe these, do these dogs can certainly sniff explosives or 
remnants of explosives on people's clothing. You know, dogs are used for arson control. They'll be able to smell accelerants on people's clothing who had just handled that stuff in the past. And so I'm sure that's what they're looking for. That's why they don't have to go through your bags. And it would be a more effective way to do it. But is there really a threat? We have seen for a decade the TSA using increasingly intrusive unconstitutional techni uh, techniques to control us, to monitor us, to harass us, and yet they haven't found anything. As a matter of fact, when they conduct their own internal tests, their failure rate is so high that the Florida congressman who created, who introduced the legislation to create the TSA, said he wanted it disbanded. But of course, he was blocked from releasing their failure rate because it was too incriminating. Now, if we really had the kind of terrorist threat that we're supposed to have, we would have seen a lot of terrorist attacks because the TSA is absolutely ineffective. But instead, what they're going to do is they're going to find other ways to harass us, if not with two-legged animals, then with four-legged animals. And we see another thing that's repeated here. We have another American stuck abroad on a no-fly list. This is from USA Today, and it says a no-fly list is blamed as a U.S. flyer is stranded in Bangkok Airport. Now, this fellow is of Pakistani family, but he grew up in America. His name is Motawala, and he's a 29-year-old U.S. citizen from Pomona, California, on his way to Indonesia, from Indonesia to L.A., when airline staff in Bangkok refused to issue him a boarding pass for his connecting flight. U.S. and Thai authorities told them that he could not travel, but they would not say why. This is what we constantly see with these no-fly lists leading him to believe that he'd been placed on the U.S. government's secret no-fly list. You know, there's never any, any trial, there's never any accusation, you're never told why you're put on it, it's just a star chamber proceeding. Continuing in the article, it says, after sleeping at the airport terminal for four nights, four nights he had to sleep in the terminal, Matawala, who is of Pakistani descent, was told that a Justice Department official had arrived from the U.S. to question him. When he declined to answer questions without a lawyer present, hey, this guy is an American who knows his rights. He was left in the custody of Th Thai authorities who held him in a detention center for 10 days. He said, they treat you like an animal. And he pointed out he was born in Anaheim 29 years ago. Now, the group that is fighting this says that, a uh, civil rights group says that cases like his show that the government has failed to carry out a 2010 policy to bring American citizens and permanent residents stuck overseas back to the U.S. regardless of their no-fly status. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, he is Pakistani origin, so I'm sure there was some kind of suspicious thing going on there. Well, if you remember, it was back in October that Wade Hicks was stranded in Hawaii on his way to Japan to see his wife, who was in the military. Now, Wade is not of Pakistani origin. He doesn't have any kind of uh, foreign uh, connection in his background. I mean, he's uh, just kind of a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kind of guy. He was also cleared recently, just before he left, by the FBI for the highest level of concealed carry, and he had been cleared by the TSA as a worker, as a transportation worker. He had a special badge for that. In spite of all that, and without any notification, he was drug off of a plane and stranded in Hawaii. And he was eventually able to get back to the States, but they would never tell him if he was on the list. They wouldn't tell him why he got put on the list. They wouldn't tell him if he was still on the list or if he could ever fly again. And this is the kind of star chamber secret proceedings that we see the government doing in every aspect of their activities in the name of war on terror. Whether it is NSA spying on people, the FISA court, which operates in secret, or whether it's these secret no-fly lists. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because today we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, 
Why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter. And in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid.